everyone. On behalf of the Sri Lanka Institute of Architects, I warmly welcome you all today's very special important launch of SLIA webinar series. We decided that declared this year as a digital year in our last council, where our members have more time to spend meaningfully when the country and health both are in seemingly difficult situation. Perhaps with low quantum of work, economic crisis and many socio-political aspects are not that conducive to practice architecture. So what could be the best way of surpassing this seemingly difficult time and era in the context of running SLIA and practicing architecture are both in really challenging status. As I mentioned, when I took over the Institute as your president just three months ago, we all should be resilient to withstand the consequences I define the term resilience as a mandate for architects, at least for an year. Robust, enterprising, smart and inclusive professional that leads with integrity and sound focus on the environment, nationality, community and education. I spoke to Biyoncha, my good, good friend Salinder, what we could do just a month ago, such a very small time after the first council meeting, we have to assist our members in a way to upgrade themselves for a different aspects to become true professionals. Being in the chartered architectural profession for a long time, perhaps we have to revisit our professional caliber, perhaps proficiency and capacity that reflect on ourselves to our clients, perhaps very important than ever before, because 21st century is very smart, very fast in digital landscape under new normal circumstances. It's amazing fact, he had his ABLE committee came up with brilliant series of programs. It's a great privilege for all of us to launch this program today in right time in right spirit as an introductory session for the mammoth task to be performed in the future. BOM will share the introductory part of these online well-coordinated study courses today, specifically designed for a purpose, for you all to evaluate and join. As I mentioned, with broad base and embedded meaning during this homestay period, perhaps surely for another five to eight months. It's a fact, these long days, we can use wisely for a real purpose to become a resilient and smart professional. We all will understand the purpose very clearly on architect plus entrepreneurship, personal branding, build an image, your image, Build and manage your image, I think. Public speaking or effective communication as a Toastmaster. Professional communication. Energy sustainability and architecture and how an architect could be an energy efficiency certified. A quite new but important aspect of anthropology in architecture and humanitarian response. Very, very timely topics and very, very timely program, I would say. Once again, I warmly welcome you all today on behalf of the Council of SLIA. And I take this opportunity uh, to recognize the great deliverables and actions taken by BOM Chair, architect Salinda Ratugam, and his very talented and able team, including our Vice President, Dilumni Dimel, I think uh, she supported professional English course and DOS master program. Honorary Secretary Upendra Randenia to make the energy certifying course and architecture course a reality. Architect Suset Behalla to explore personal branding, very important to all of us. Architect Shevi Basnayaka to came up with new subject area 
where a lot of architects can explore new job opportunities with NGOs, INGOs, perhaps to do socially responsible architecture as projects. And entire BOA members, the great performance, even before our first UG, it is a really, really good achievement, I would say, to bring these meaningful, purposeful courses very quickly to boost our fraternity to the next level of 21st century. This is a good opportunity, I would say, for all of us to make understanding of what SLIA is ready to offer to you all, then we all together will get sharpened up ourselves. These courses will be ready soon after this webinar. So you all understand what really content in these courses after today's deliberations by able panel of speakers in the flyer I saw. I would say it's a matter of registration. I am humbly requesting all of you to please register with these courses with the BOM and make use of the extra time for an extra mileage of our professional career during the pandemic to create smart professionals for trending future. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you, uh, Architect Russell, for sharing your vision and mandate for your tenure as president and your thoughts on the courses offered by the Board of Management. Um, next, I call upon architect Salinda Rathugaman uh, to introduce the team. Thank you, Kalpani, uh, and thank you, Mr. President, for the comprehensive introduction. Um, we have six presentations today, starting with Energy Sustainability and Architecture by Dr. Upin Rajabaksha. Uh, <clears throat> then, uh, the second will be by Mrs. Irushi Aluihare uh, on personal branding, that is uh, build an image, uh, build and manage your image. Then uh, Dr. Clive C. James will introduce you Postmasters program. And then there will be a presentation on professional communication by Dr. Vipula Vanigasekara. Um, uh, Mr. Hemi the Jayavira is supposed to enlighten us on the course of entrepreneurship. Uh, last but not the least, our own Chevy, architect Chevy Batsnaik, uh, intends to give you a brief introduction on the course uh, she has planned to implement. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Thank you, Architect um, So the first course to be introduced is Energy Sustainability and Architecture. Uh, to be delivered by Dr. Upendra Rajapaksha. Um, he's a practicing architect, um, an educator, and an academic. Um, he's currently attached as a senior lecturer uh, at, to the Department of Architecture, University of Morotua. Um, he's also a, an associate editor of Architectural Science Journal of the University of Sydney, Australia, um, and a reviewer for the Journal of Asian Architecture and Building Engineering from Taylor and Francis, UK. Um, he's an external academic for the School of Architecture, Monster University of Applied Science in Germany. Um, so Dr. Upendra Rajapaksha, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction and invitation by the SLIA. So let me start uh, my presentation. Uh, I'm going to introduce a new course on uh, sustainable design for architects, uh, especially the members of SLIA. So I would like to uh, term this um, the caliber of this type of buildings as high performance buildings because um, I am going to request uh, from the members of SLIA today that uh, we will avoid using uh, green buildings, the term green building, because uh, this uh, term is uh, misused by many of our stakeholders and it gives a wrong interpretation. So um, uh, I would like to invite or request you to use a new term to describe this type of buildings, 
high performance build lanes. High performance build lanes could address climate emergencies such as extensive heat stress in warm climates and coldness in winter climates as well. These buildings have operational energy efficiency in terms of uh, uh, usage. There can be several indicators to measure sustainability, but the energy performance level of a building can be used as the most appropriate indicator to measure sustainability. Addressing heat stress, for example in tropics, through the design for the benefit of occupants comfort inside buildings and the environment at large has become a priority with new challenges for architects. So therefore, designing sustainable buildings or energy sustainable buildings or energy high performance buildings is becoming significantly important. I have a slight problem, uh, sorry about that. So high performance buildings, now you can see um, two sections of a building. This is a building in operation in a, in a moderate climate, not in Sri Lanka. And this building is designed for energy efficiency. And this building is designed for daytime and also the building is designed for night ventilation as well. The, the picture on the right, a section on the right shows how the building behaves with the night ventilation. And it helps to remove all heat collected during the daytime. And the result will be benefited during the following day. So these sections, especially uh, in respect to its allocation and allocation of spaces, the levels, the detailing of envelopes, introducing various uh, vertical um, air plenums, and um, few uh, mechanically supported systems help the entire building to work as a high performance building. These are some of the images of this uh, building. The plan form, its geometry, the envelope detailing, and in, even in the interior, for example, high thermal mass ceilings and various type of uh, vertical ducting promotes passive cooling during winter. And significance of this building is that the same building works for winter climates as well. In winter, heat stress is beneficial and building can manage to retain heat inside the building and provide necessary heating. And during summer period, the same detailing provides and promotes the removal of heat from inside and cool air flow into the building. So this building performs well in terms, of, in terms of its energy usage during the building operation. On the other hand, another building in tropics found in Colombo is designed with its unique section with a double skin envelope. This detailing supports to avoid the heat gain from outside, heat gain from warm outside and it is designed to withstand the negative effect of heat stress. Another example is designed to promote thermal stratification. This is also in tropics and the building sections, architectural design of its plan form, envelope and some of the most of the and some of the other details provides thermal stratification during the night and as and even the daytime as well. So these forms works much better with the climate emergencies and these buildings have a better resilience to climate emergencies. The graph on the top shows three types of lines 
the black line shows the temperature behavior the ambient temperature behavior over three days and it has peaks three peaks during the daytime and the red dotted line shows a conventional behavior of most of the office buildings in Colombo, which shows an overheated situation so you may have experienced this type of behavior in most of the buildings found in tropics the green line shows the behavior of high performance buildings due to the contribution from architectural building helps to avoid heat gain coming from outside remove heat produced inside the building to outside and also to reduce or modify modify the ambient conditions to a greater lower level inside the building so in this type of buildings with uh, temperature behaviors as in green line has a favorable condition to reach its preferred comfort level for example if you want to introduce an air conditioner the energy the amount of energy required to bring down the temperature to preferred comfort level is very minimal as compared to a conventional practice so this is the whole scenario or the whole fundamental understanding of high performance buildings however a scenario from colombo is bringing you very disappointing results a research carried out using 81 modern office building population in colombo reveals a disappointment disappointed results the graph shows a red line a horizontal red line and that is the set point temperature of most of air condition buildings despite set point temperature of air conditioners the internal temperature was measured and found that internal temperature behavior shown in uh, three different lines especially in black lines shows an increase of indoor temperature despite set point temperature at 24 at what at one point the internal temperature was found to be 10.5 higher, higher, higher than the set point temperature so this is a critical situation Colombo. and if you think about the climate emergencies that we are going to face in future and also the the potential of our buildings to face all is problematic so therefore these are some of the problems that found in uh, in our context in Sri Lanka because of the heat stress outside heat stress is a catalyst we cannot forget about that and we need to address that heat stress we need to design buildings to minimize heat stress or, or to co avoid completely avoid heat stress inside building and to maintain comfortable indoor temperature so it's a business deal it's a business to deal with buildings and temperature so we need to design buildings to air temperature there are many other factors that we need to design social concerns contextual concerns identity character equally heat stress is an important consideration for our climate so therefore to support this initiative Sri Lanka Institute of Architects and UDA initiated the program two, two years ago and we developed uh, with the help of then uh, BOM a course outlining 10 units the unit 1 will teach you or will give some indication about energy utility index of buildings a conceptual framework to define uh, different building categories and the unit 2 will deal with uh, sustainable planning of buildings involving many sub areas like site selection sitting of buildings microclimatic enhancement and so on then in the unit 2 we'll focus on building materials different types of building materials like lightweight heavyweight uh, locally available or imported or different types of materials construction for construction and also for finishers so building materials and sustainable construction so there will be issues like uh, embodied energy 
reuse and recycling opportunities for building material, sustainable design, and so on. Unit 2, which is an important area for architects, an important area for design building designers, deals with demand side efficiency of architecture. And they are synchronizing indoor temperature. As I said earlier, high performance buildings can synchronize outdoor ambient and air temperature into a favorable indoor air temperature. So this is the unique art of making buildings energy efficient. And bioclimatic enhancement of architecture, building climate in interplay. We need to understand how building behaves with climate. If you want to design high performance building, if you want to design energy efficient building, then addressing indoor overheating situations. In most situations, we experience this indoor overheating in Sri Lanka. And we think that this is usual or this is ordered. We are used to this. No, this is a problem that we need to address. We have to design buildings to, uh, to have more resilient powers to indoor overheating or climate. Then microclimate, plan form, sectional form and building envelopes, they are areas an architect can handle and the U-value of materials, indoor outdoor comfort. So this area will cover this area, these concerns and disciplines. The next unit is five, the demand side efficiency through system integration. So light, lighting, air conditioning, uh, sewing of uh, various functions, electrical illumination. So there are many sub areas. Then in unit six, indoor environment quality. You have to have healthy indoor environments because of pollution outside. Sometimes even air conditioned buildings experience unhealthy indoor environments. So how do we design indoor uh, buildings with uh, healthy indoor environment? It's a question. And this unit 6 will give you some lessons, basic lessons. Then the unit 7, supply side efficiency through renewables is another concern. So you can think about various uh, type of um, renewable energy resources like wind power, solar power. But um, there is no point of uh, providing renewable energies if the building is not working efficiently for energy. So you have to first have a, a high performance buildings and then think about providing renewable energy resources. Then daylight efficiency. Sri Lanka is a country with uh, plenty of daylight but we, we, we don't see uh, buildings designed effectively and innovatively and creatively for daylight. So we need to know about how buildings can, could be designed for daylighting and we need to know about the science of daylighting. Then next, the water management and waste management. So they are areas which will benefit you uh, to design high performance buildings and also this knowledge will help you to be a certifier, especially in particular for the Urban Development Authority's uh, uh, energy efficient building system. And in the next one, I will just summarize a generic model for cooling develop. So this is a this is just one slide, and uh, so you will get you will get some insight about these interventions, design interventions uh, with buildings, and how these can contribute to have cool indoors uh, before we introduce air conditioners. So buildings, microclimates, there are many areas like its own climate, recent microclimates and there are many variables can be controlled like layout, positioning, orientation, spacing between built and unbuilt spaces, vertical section of well, So all these variables or design uh, components will contribute to enhance the microclimate for passive cooling. Then at the second level, building form, its plan form and sectional. There are many areas in this uh, uh, component like uh, plan geometry, uh, plan sectional depth and then diversity in air pressure zones due to temperature, orientation, planning for passive and active zone, planning for buffer zone. So all these concerns can be 
manipulated to create favorable indoor environments in terms of air temperature and at last building envelope different types of materials thermophysical characteristics facade and vertical geometry so all design variables are part of architects work with a 6b pencil and a butter sheet you can manipulate all these things and design buildings to have a favorable indoor environment very simply we can design resilient buildings we can design resilient buildings for future climate future climate is uh, scientists have suggested that with the global global warming scenario future climate is going to be more hotter in warm tropics and so these kind of interventions will help you to design buildings with proper resilience to climate emergencies and at last we can think about mechanical plants to create or promote the efficiency of buildings at the moment most of the systems are based on mechanical plants but there are plenty of other opportunities around us around architects so therefore do not miss this opportunity so with this program uh, we would like to introduce two new disciplines to architects members architectural physics and architectural aerodynamics architectural physics it deals with um, heat and how building forms deals with heat outside and heat inside architectural aerodynamics provides some basic understanding of how building forms or architecture deals with airflow so this is a science in art of making high performance buildings and climate responsive design so so that's the whole scenario of this um, summary or summative presentation of the the course that we are going to introduce and this will have 10 units as described will run over 12 weeks or over 12 weekends and so other details will be um, published later and so we are in the we have we developed this um, program and uh, now we are in the process of uh, developing more details and syllabus and i would like to acknowledge the former chairman of uh, pab architect uh, upendra randini and then also former chairman of uda professor jagat mura singh as well for initiating this uh, program uh, two years ago and also slia uh, council and sli members and also and also members of the slia thank you very much hope uh, you got a very basic understanding of what we are going to do thank you um next we have um introduction for the course on your personal branding uh, building and managing your image by mrs irushi aluvihare um she is a director of image consultant private limited um she is an accountant accountant by profession and has over 10 years of training experience her core focus is soft skills development she has worked with numerous corporate school and university students and individuals across sri lanka so ms uh, irushi over to you go so very good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, the president of course and uh, members of bomb uh, esteemed panelists i think we have a good 7 to 8 panelists this evening and of course all architects professional architects on board today so thank you very much for spending your evening with us and it is indeed a pleasure and it is actually interesting to see that we have across uh, close to about 100 members on this forum today so that shows the level of interest that you have taken uh, to invest your time in your development so uh it was amazing to see the presentation of the former speaker i didn't know there were so many technicalities about designing and constructing a building it is truly fascinating so let's move on to the topic in hand and what i am here to talk to you about today is work on yourself right so um as you can see in this picture there that there, there, there are two uh, sets of branches one is obviously a very green and lush a uh, tree and then the other is that scraggly old grayish uh, you know um it doesn't have any sort of nourishment it, it lags so
So what we are trying to do today is to take our cup of tea and our cup of coffee and sit down and think, is it time that we invest or has the time come for us to invest on developing ourselves, right? So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So I'll give a brief description. Um, as Kalpini mentioned, I'm Irushya Luihare, and I'm a director at Image Consultants. Now at Image, we predominantly focus on personality development. In other words, a more sort of common terminology is soft skills, right? So we focus on enriching one's personality. Now in saying that, we're not saying that your personalities are not good or you have a lot of work to do. That's not our take. But there's so much more that we can do. So the company was established in 1995 uh, with a vision to uplift every personality or every individual's personality in Sri Lanka. So who exactly is our target audience? And I'd like to take you through the human life cycle, right? So um, this is not a company profile, but what I want to tell you is that at every stage in our life, starting from perhaps the age of three or five, progressing into our teens, into our youthful years, into middle age, right? Even whilst we have all the technical qualifications in hand, we certainly need to invest time in developing our personality. And I've listened to the president speak this evening, and I've also listened to our first panelist. And one word is a trigger word. I believe it's the theme of today's meeting or today's webinar. And the word is resilience, right? Now, how exactly do you develop resilience? You develop resilience through your personality. Yes, you can develop resilience through your building. And then there's a structural uh, educational process in doing so. But one of the other critical things that us individuals need to have is to be the ability to bounce back across any form of stress. And this pandemic has clearly taught us the importance of bouncing back, right? We, we were in a perfect world where we considered going to work, having many projects, many emails, stressful. Now we have come to a junction where we don't have much work and yet life has become stressful. So to me, working with many people across Sri Lanka and the globe, reading and analyzing human behavior, I understand that one of the key things that can get us through any situation is our personality. And one trait is this word, significant word that all speakers today have spoken about is resilience. So as per the target audience of image consultants, it is across the entire human life cycle. So we've spoken to young kids, um, as school leavers, youthful professionals, middle-aged, right? And even maybe senior citizens. So personality upliftment or enrichment is open for anyone who is willing to invest their time in getting their benefit, right? So this is um, a famous quote mentioned by Stephen Covey. He says, we must never be too busy to sharpen our soul." right? Uh, technically, when we are busy on projects, when we have many clients, we are uh, switching in and out of different projects, we consider ourselves busy and we don't upgrade our skills. Now, the truth of the reality is that in Sri Lanka, we have a huge population of educated professionals, whether it be architecture, whether it be accountancy, like the profession where I come from, whether it's finance, management, HR, uh, almost everyone has a degree is, pro is professionally qualified. But what, di uh, what differentiates each of these professionals? It's the fact that you need to sharpen your saw, both in terms of technica technical skills and soft skills. And I'm here today to talk to you about the soft skills element. So we have uh, compiled a comprehensive program which runs across 12 weeks, pre predominantly focusing on your personality enhancement. Right. So this uh, is a cross section of programs that we have done across Sri Lanka. Now, the objective of us designing a program of this nature for you professionals is very simple. It is clearly to encourage each participant to conduct themselves in a professional manner so that it actually creates identity, brand identity, and also an image for the industry. So when we see you, 
it is not only a name that we see. So when I see Salinda, it's not Salinda a name, but he creates an identity, not only for himself as an architect, not only himself as a chartered architect, but also for the profession, right? So that with that intention, we have designed the program also. One thing that I uh, clearly believe, um, Sri Lankans are truly professionals and our services should be taken to outside waters, to overseas markets. So if we are to be competent, to compete in the international market, we need to have that confidence. We need to have that per, uh, professional persona and create a strong image identity in our industry. So with all those objectives in mind, we designed a comprehensive program. Now, what I'm going to do here today, I'm going to just, uh, I just need to tap into your brains and I'm going to do a little bit of a brain teaser. And I hope at least I would have a couple of answers. That's good enough for me to go. So I'm going to give you, um, sorry, I'm going to give you nine dots. I'm going to give you nine dots. And the task is that you have to connect these nine dots in four straight lines without lifting the pen, right? Now, I, I, I think some of you might have a piece of pen and paper uh, accessible. Uh, if you could just do a quick sketch, quick sketch and tell me the results, right? I know uh, this is practiced in many sort of MBA programs, but if you have done it, please be honest, don't give me the answer. I'd like to pick some brains who haven't tried this exercise. So let's, let's dedicate about 30 seconds and see how we could do this. And if you could just uh, show me your image, that would be fabulous. I can see lots of little artists on the screen. I fully encourage that as well. If you can do your little artwork, but keep on trying. Yes, so there's one image here. Anyone with a different picture, with a different image? Okay, so time, the clock is ticking, so let's progress. So I am, I need to, okay, that's gone. So here it is. So here I have my nine dots and this is how we should connect these nine dots in four lines. Line number one, line number two, line number three and line number four. Now, once again, I would revert to the audience and I would like to pick your brain and see what did I do differently here? Or what, what, what is the difference? What is the speciality of this image? If somebody could actually unmute and speak, that would be fabulous. What have we done differently on this image? I can see lots of professional architects on board and I would love to hear your voices. Of course, I cannot see your videos, but just a voice, just an answer would go a long way. Just one answer. What's the speciality here? Oh, absolutely thinking outside the box and this is a common feature i think in in the profession of architecture you do think outside the box but generally what happens to us humans is we are very much in a frame we think in a box we look at the same problem in the same with the same dimensions without expanding our horizons so this is what this is actually the theme of this entire program or building personal image. So it says, let us devote 12 sessions to start thinking about the same things, about the same practices, but do it in a different way. So very simple, as Abraham Lincoln says, if I had six hours to chop down a tree, I would spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. So invest your time in the greatest tool you have in hand. And that's not your pencils, that's not your technology, that's not your computer. But the biggest asset you have within yourself is your mindset, is your personality to grow big, to develop in career, and of course, enrich as an individual. So here's the program outline. I know it's very simple. There's lots of content built in. Unfortunately, I couldn't share everything. Contact uh, SLIA for, for the details. So we begin with developing a resilient attitude. And as I said, that's the theme of today, according to my opinion. So how exactly can we create an open mindset? Uh, you know, lots of people talk about positive attitude, but are we really positive? Rather, let's start looking at things from a new eye, new perspective. Be open to challenges, not whinge, not complain. So develop a more resilient attitude. And along with that, 
let's uplift our personal image, including the way we dress. Now, I mean, working online, uh, working at working from home, working online, this entire concept of dressing well is distorted, right? We have, uh, you know, probably some people are in their pajamas, but that's not professional uh, behavior or professional image. We still need to upload that. Right. So we talk about personal grooming, your hygiene, the way you should dress, even the way you should represent your organization or your profession at a business cocktail. And then moving on to the next topic of business etiquette. How do you conduct yourself at a business meeting on the telephone when you uh, when you are sort of script out an email when you're there at a cocktail? How do you conduct yourself? Right. Um, so this talks about your behavior practices in a professional context, because remember, about chartered architects, I'm talking about creating an identity for yourself and for your industry. And of course, placing you on a platter to compete in the overseas market. Of course, moving on to the next one is dining etiquette. How do you dine? How do you dine at a five star hotel at a seven course meal? right how do you click that glass at the cocktail how do you mingle so these are attributes these are traits that we need to have right what, what, what sort of what sort of fork should we use when we are uh, what sort of knife should we use when we are sort of dismantling the fish what's the desert spoon what's the desert knife and it is very common that you and i could make these mistakes because we are sri lankans we, we, we were born to eat with our fingers and not the fork and spoon. So it's a skill that you acquire. It's nothing to be ashamed of, but it's a skill that you acquire. Similar to a foreigner coming to Sri Lanka and indulging in our rice and curry with his fingers, right? And the next one is moving on to life management. How do you actually manage your 24 hours, right? We are not going to tell you how to run your life, but it's basically tips and getting you to look at the same 24 hours from a different perspective, from a different uh, different outlook, opening up your mindset, talking about resilience at each of these stages. And the next one or the last slab is developing your professional image, convincing communication in terms of your verbal, your nonverbal skills. And also, how do you implement that when you do a presentation? When you do a presentation to your, it may be to your client, it may be at a workshop. Uh, when you say presentation, it necessarily does not mean uh, a PowerPoint presentation. It could be even an elevator pitch. And I know as architects, you don't use this word pitch, but when you say elevator pitch, it means just introducing yourself in the elevator, which only takes two minutes to go up and down uh, between floors. How do you create a professional business impression in just one or two minutes, right? So that's the entire program outline and how we're gonna do it. It's basically 12 sessions conducted once or twice a week, nitty gritty will be notified and one and a half hour sessions with an intention of actually meeting you in person for the final dining etiquette session. It will be conducted via Zoom or Teams. So we do have uh, a lot of access to this on online portals, which is excellent. And of course, at the end, Image Consultants wants to test your knowledge, your personality. What have you learned? What have you upgraded by doing a small role play assessment, a PowerPoint presentation upon which you'll be awarded a certificate of participation. However, the trick is you need to have at least a minimum of 75% attendance for us to consider yourself participated in this program, which is essential. Remember, you're not participating in this for the benefit of anyone else, but yourself, you're investing your time, your precious time to grow your personality, thereby growing your career and your life at large. You're, it's a skill for life. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So people will throw stones uh, at you. Don't throw stones back at them. Collect them and build an empire. So I think this is an opening. It's only yet a very small step in the right, director, right direction. Um, it's better than doing the wrong things. So it's a very small step to build that professionalism, make you more resilient and smarter, which is, I believe, the dream or the objective of SLIA. So let's join in. It's a very small program. It's got to be very interactive. 
So um, I think let's ask a, a question and answer session maybe later on. Nevertheless, you can contact SLIA for further information. So thank you very much. Keep learning and your future will Next be we free. have uh, presentation number three uh, on Toastmasters by Dr. Clive C. James. Uh, Dr. Clive, are you there? Okay, um, so just a brief introduction uh, to Dr. Clive. He's a medical doctor by profession and a director in, the, in his family business as well. Currently, he's the vice president of education um, and president elect of the Millennium uh, Toastmasters Club. Uh, his Toastmasters journey started through a speech craft program uh, organized by the Ministry of Health in 2017. And after that, he transitioned um, and joined uh, the Millennium Toastmasters Club. Uh, he's a competent communicator and a dynamic leader. He has won uh, numerous speech contest awards in several categories, including humorous speech and international speech um, contests. So Dr. Clive, uh, if you may start. Um, I would like to thank Professor Russell Zandania and the Sri Lankan Institute of Architects for having me here and also trying to run this program. Professor Russell and I share a similarity. Uh, since I would be taking over as the president of the Millennium Toastmasters Club, we both could be named as the online presidents. Because, you know, when you take over as presidents for a year or so now, most of us have to do our uh, entire year online. And what, how best would he have put uh, that to utilize this time that you are having plenty? And as uh, Irushi said, use this time to sharpen your weapon and this is the best time to sharpen your weapon of course your technical skills and the soft skills and i will be focusing more towards the soft skill towards public speaking <clears throat> so before i get to this slide i would like to share a personal story uh, i was working in the cardiology unit i think it was the year 2009 cardiology unit ward 61 at national hospital and one day there was an architect who was admitted to the chest pain so we went through the entire program he underwent a coronary and Joe there he had a couple of blocks, we sorted it, he spoke to him, he consented for it, and he was discharged, but eventually we became sort of buddies and friends uh, over clinic visits and so on. Uh, after a couple of weeks, I called him uh, and asked if he could help me out with my house, which I was trying to renovate, and he came to the site, had a look, and he spoke to me so many things about how to renovate my house, and I turned to him and said, Mr. Pereira, I really didn't understand anything you said. And he turned back to me and said, Doctor, a couple of years back, you spoke to me about my heart. And I honestly didn't understand anything, but I trusted you with my heart. You took care of my heart. Let me take care of your house. That's what he said. But that message drove deep into me that we in Sri Lanka are so <clears throat> uh, comfortable speaking technically because our education system is more focused on technical aspects rather than the soft aspects. And we take it for granted where we communicate to people technically and technical terms, and we actually believe that they understand what we are saying. So this is when the Minister of Health also, <coughs> sorry, decided that the uh, soft skills of doctors had to be improved. And they ran a speech craft program, which I joined. And from there, of course, a uh, couple of doctors carried on as Toastmasters. So what a Toastmasters International do, it enhances your public speaking ability and also it guides your and also improves your leadership quality and what when you come to the speech craft program it's a sort of a miniature program of the toastmasters program itself it uh, allows you to improve your presentation skills there is advice from the toastmasters membership there's preparations on short talks impromptu speaking many of us shy away from public speaking the moment there's somebody asks, can somebody give a toast all of us are hiding putting our heads down uh, you're not looking at me somebody asks is there any questions in the audience? We are all trying to shy away and try to go to the back bench. So tips on public speaking, how to evaluate speeches and also how to listen to speeches and the guests get the best out of it. This could be run in a couple of ways. There are four modes of running a speech craft program. There are four sessions, six session, eight session and 10 session workshop. But we are proposing for the membership is a 10 session workshop, which will be done every week as two of our programs. It can include it in the club meeting itself. The Toastmasters Club also has its own meetings twice a month, every Tuesdays. So some of these workshops could be incorporated into the club meeting, but most of it will be 
uh, separate independent workshops as speechcraft workshops. So as you go through one of these 10 week workshop, you go through a couple of levels. And in level one, we try to uh, enhance you to take table topics. Table topics means impromptu speaking. You randomly are given a topic and then you have given 10 seconds to prepare and then just speak on it for about a minute or two. Then of course the icebreaker, it's about breaking the ice in public speaking. Most of you all could be conversant public speakers, but some of you all might not be. So in that sense, I think uh, how to come out and first break the ice and become a public speaker. Level, how to organize a speech. For instance, how do you start with the attention grabbing opening? How do you bring some humor into the speech? How do you keep the audience attentive during your speech? How to bring the vocal variety and how do you get to the point? And then in level three, of course, you will be uh, more focused towards bringing the body language in any speech. Actually, 60 percent is the, the body that speaks. Of course, in online speeches, it's a facial expression that matters the most and vocal variety. But then we will also be touching on how the body can speak and get the message across uh, to the audience and how to say it in level four. And then at level four, you will be also evaluating other speeches. So you have come to a certain level, now you can actually earn some sort of a competency to evaluate other speeches. The program has resources. We'll be giving uh, the Speechcraft workbook and the coordinator's guide. This will be provided. You will be going through the entire workbook, which I have shared a soft copy with you all. And it can go as real time, online and anytime uh, sessions. Of course, the real time is when we can do a practical and evaluation session. Online is when you have videos, recorded speeches, you know, sent across to the evaluators. So during this program, let's see if you are at 25, 30 or 20 participants, five participants will be given a one mentor and you all be constantly communicating with this mentor, sending recordings, uh, trying to get ideas and consultancies from this person. And of course, these mentors are very seasoned postmasters and are in the public uh, uh, forums in Sri Lanka, quite well known. So these mentors will be mentoring five of your speakers right throughout the program. And any additional material could be uh, sought out at toastmasters.org. You can visit Toastmasters. You can just Google Speechcraft on YouTube on uh, the Toastmasters website itself. From Speechcraft, you can join Toastmasters later on. That is another given advantage because Toastmasters is also improving yourself. And some of the soft skill improvement does not happen in 10 weeks or does not happen in 10 months. I have realized in my Toastmasters journey how I have improved. I was sort of an introvert who would shy off from coming to a public forum and speaking, but largely it has taken me to the level of competing and even competing career three years back, I would never chance, stand a chance. Today I am probably standing a chance in the top 30 or top 20 and hope to improve further. So it is a continuous process. Right. As it was mentioned, you know, sharpening the weapon does not stop. The weapon gets blunt here and there. So the Toastmasters program is also a networking opportunity. It's not just speech development or, or leadership development. It is also providing you a networking opportunity. There are a lot of professionals from different caliber of, uh, you know, uh, industries who are in the Toastmasters uh, fraternity in Sri Lanka across 160 clubs. And you will be interacting with all of them. And the current Toastmasters program gives 10 pathways. You can, I'm not going to read out the pathways. So you can elect the pathway which you are more comfortable or which you think is more suitable to you and then head on in that particular path. And you can do one or two or even three, four paths as you progress in your Toastmasters career. And this is the Millennium Toastmasters Club. These are the members who will be assisting. There is one architect around there. I don't know. I hope you all recognize her. And um, these are the people who will be assisting you all throughout the program. So how important it is to develop your soft skills. We have already gone through it. It is also important to develop the part of public speaking, reading the right message across, getting the message across and also negotiating you all up. You're going to face a lot of client interviews, client presentations, a uh, lot of interviews per se for jobs. So in all these places, how comfortable you are breaking that nervousness in public speaking and to become a very competent public speaker, one-to-one -one or one-to-many. And uh, that said, most of the information can be shared during Q&A sessions or could be found through your uh, institute. Thank the you. The next um, presentation is on professional communication by Dr. Vipula Vanigasekara. 
Um, he's a product of Royal College and holds um, Sim UK and MBA and a PhD. Uh, he also holds a diploma in classical music. He carries years of private sector experience and later state uh, positions uh, with senior di di uh, diplomat, Sri Lanka Foreign Service, Director General, Sri Lanka Tourism. He was also a former honorary advisor to the Ministry of Defense. He's currently a senior lecturer of Edith Cowan University in Perth, Australia. Um, Dr. Vipula, you are there. Are you there? Right. Um, well, after listening to Irushi on personal branding, I'm now wondering whether to come live on the screen or keep my photograph that was taken a few years ago. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, hi, everyone, and a um, very good evening to all of you, uh, President, Board of Management, and members of uh, SLIA, IBO1. I'm Vipravan Sekhara, the coordinator of the proposed professional communication program. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> It, it goes without saying that uh, this is a privilege for me to address uh, an erudite community in the Sri Lankan society and uh, make a contribution uh, to an effort of SLIA to enhance the profiles of its members through these courses, especially at a time uh, we are compelled to slow down uh, for obvious reasons. But at the same time, um, the entire business sector across the world, including yours, is looking for various other opportunities or, or trying to foresee uh, what may be called emerging opportunities in the future in the post-COVID uh, era. Um, I have actually worked with uh, some of you during my time as Director General of Sri Lanka Tourism. And those who got involved with our projects will remember Pasakuda, Kuchiveli, Kalpiti, and Yala. And they were all fully operational due uh, prior, to, prior to COVID. And these prospects are in the vicinity um, after this uh, pandemic is over. I'm, of course, uh, here to play a different role. Uh, but let me clarify uh, that uh, you should not consider this as a communication course similar to what the Toastmasters are, are going to do. Ours is more of a back-end operation, so to say, um, because we want to gear you with uh, professional English language skills in several areas. Given uh, the fact that uh, a good part of your job is uh, is communication. I believe um, it is needless to elaborate the importance of English language and communication skills. Um, so I'm the coordinator of this uh, program, and uh, my colleague Madhumini Rajapaksa will be the other partner throughout this course. Madhumini is a specialist in teaching professional English in a structured manner, while I'll be contributing in sharing, through sharing techniques in which how you could communicate messages uh, in an effective way in pragmatic and, and business sense. Um, your curriculum will consist of grammar and writing. As you know, without grammar, you go nowhere. Then reading, listening, and speaking. The, the course includes, it goes into minute details, even to teach you how to send emails, WhatsApp messages, messages, and make credible communication. Um, this, this lesson plan, for all sessions is focused on architects' progressive improvement during the course. And you will be evaluated and results will be certified by SLIA. Uh, 
like the others, it will be 12 sessions with uh, three hours each, plus the evaluations and assessments. Uh, we will give you a detailed outline of the, uh, the curriculum, including areas, plus the types of evaluations envisaged. I must mention that the, the course takes on board your profession, the terminologies, uh, the architectural language to make it more practical. All the resources uh, will be given to you, the material, the videos, uh, etc. Uh, well in advance. Um, you see, um, English is not our mother tongue. Not everyone has similar skills in English communication. Uh, nevertheless, the English language is vital when you need to deal with foreign clients, investors, the businessmen, as well as English speaking community in Sri Lanka. I'm sure uh, you will agree uh, for some reason or other, the English speaking community in Sri Lanka is quite comfortable to work in their familiar language, although we are not here to judge whether it is right or wrong. Instead, why not gear ourselves? Um, when I recruited officers to Tourist Board and, and, and the Convention Bureau, I used to give the candidates uh, a question for an essay type answer to do it on a Word document with which I could ascertain their language skills as well as computer literacy to some extent, in addition to uh, the subject knowledge, of course. Um, every time I meet a doctor, whether my family doctor or any other specialist, I make it a point to speak in English. You know why? The answer is obvious, isn't it? So apart from what you can see, the advantages of improving communication skills here in this slide, um, I may add one, and that is the clarity in communication. Uh, this I see as a major flaw that costs us a lot of time to rectify, and time is precious. Uh, so these are the uh, learning outcome. Uh, let me see. It's, these are the learning outcome. Um, expected at the end of the course, which means this is what you will gain from the investment you are making for this program. In simple language, this is an opportunity for you to acquire a competitive edge in your profession, um, which I believe will have a, a Next, we have a presentation of entrepreneurship um, by Mr. Heminder Jayavira. Uh, Heminder, are you there? Okay. Yes, I'm um, So, uh, Hamil Zavira is a recipient of the prestigious Eisenhower Fellowship uh, for the year 2020 and is currently the Chief Operating Officer of Slimtech, the pioneer nanotech and advanced research facility in Sri Lanka. Heminda obtained his bachelor's degree in electronics and telecommunications engineering from the University of Moratua and MBA in Management Technology from the University of Moratua as well. He has worked over a decade in Dialogue Axiata and Axiata group of companies, specializing in new products and innovation management. He has consulting experience in this area in Malaysia, Cambodia, and Bangladesh. Uh, Heminda is a serial innovator and entrepreneur. Uh, he co-founded Gendo, a med tech startup that has patents in US and Japan for a non-invasive medical device to identify cardiovascular diseases. He also co-founded Turu, a green tech initiative that is focused on utilizing technology for accelerating reforestation. He's a director at Effective Solutions Private Limited, an IoT company that has offices in Japan and Cambridge, UK. He's also a director at Vibhava Solutions Private Limited, 
uh, a company working on solutions related to plastic recycling and upcycling under the brand name Zero Trash. Heminder is also a director of Ceylon Graphene Technologies, the first graphene and advanced material company in Sri Lanka established in 2018. Heminder is, um, he, he as a senior fellow uh, in innovation and, and entrepreneurship of University of Moratua, started Mora Ventures, a University of Moratua based startup incubator. Under his leadership, uh, Mora, Mora Ventures um, launched 30 startups within its first two years, and one of them reached a valuation of US dollars 1 million. In 2018, he co founded Venture Frontier Lanka, an integrated startup platform focused on development of the complete startup life cycle. Heminda is a seasoned trainer in design thinking and rapid prototyping for corporates. Uh, so Heminda, we are delighted to have you. Um, over to you. Thank you very much. So uh, let me ask a question. I think we have about uh, 64 participants here. So uh, uh, imagine that uh, I think most of you may be, uh, there can be fresh graduates as well. Uh, some of the some of the uh, Architects here must be working somewhere. Some of the architects may be having their own organization as well. Uh, but if I ask a question, say, if you want to get a job uh, and maybe you've been offered, say, 100,000 as salary in the first few years, and then maybe after some time you get promoted in your organization, maybe you increase, you get a, you, your salary maybe, uh, say, going up to 200,000, maybe uh, after 10, 20, 10 years later, you might get a salary of maybe 500,000, right? So that's uh, how it happens. And maybe uh, after 20, 30 years time, maybe you are the CEO of the organization or the chief uh, design officer or chief uh, marketing officer or whoever. You must be drawing a, a salary of maybe 1 million rupees. So if you add all that, say for a period of say 30 years, how much will it be roughly? The amount of money that you would take uh, from the, year that you start your uh, employ, uh, employability, say at the age of say 20 or 25, until you're, you know, say at the age of 55, which is the, uh, the, of course you can work more than 55 now, but at least if you take that first 30 to 35 years in your entire career, how, how much of money that you can earn? Any idea? Has someone calculated that? So I did a bit of research. I actually asked him that question uh, from various people, uh, uh, especially I got a chance to speak to almost all the engineering graduates in University of Moratua. And, uh, and when I asked the same question, I did a bit of calculation and it comes to about roughly 190 million Sri Lankan rupees. So that's the amount of money you can earn in a period of your lifetime of where you work, say 30 to 35 years, even maybe more, but a lot of money. But if you divide that by, uh, say, 190 or 195, which is the dollar value, which comes to about 1 million US dollars. So that's roughly in a lifetime of employability, you are going to earn about 1 million US dollars. So that's the value creation that you create within a period of 30 to 30 plus years. So this is where the trick is. Uh, so a lot of people talks about uh, Sri Lanka being a uh, middle income earning country. We, we have been a developing country for the last maybe many decades. Uh, if you ask from your parents, they might say we were in a, you know, a developing country. Uh, today also we are calling ourselves a developing country, but it, it has never changed. So we are in a, what you call the middle income trap. So how you move out of that is actually the professionals can't do it. So that's the uh, sad reality. Professionals cannot take a country from uh, middle income uh, economy to a developed country. The only people who can do is the innovators and entrepreneurs. So that's why innovators and entrepreneurs are known as the engine of growth in a country. So we have to create more innovators, more entrepreneurs. And I'll, I'll give you why an innovator or an entrepreneur can create wealth. Now I mentioned a person, a professional during his entire lifetime, he will earn about 1 million US dollars, but 
my experience, I have been working with a couple of uh, University of Moratua based uh, uh, student entrepreneurs. Uh, the first time I met uh, them was in 2016, 2017. Two to three years later, I know about three uh, people, three entrepreneurs, of course, not one person, couple of people. Uh, within about two to three years time, their organization now worth about US dollar one million. So this is the, the difference. If a normal person, a, a professional takes 30 to 30, uh, 40 plus years to create 1 million US dollars, but entrepreneur, a very talented entrepreneur can create this within two to three years time. So that's what you call uh, creating value or creating uh, value and of course, uh, going into uh, value creation. So that's the, uh, so that's what I wanted to promote among uh, budding uh, architects and of course the professional architects as well. Uh, if you want to create wealth, uh, it's not about just you uh, earning money, but as a country, uh, we need more entrepreneurs, more innovators uh, in our society. Of course, everybody can't become an entrepreneur. Everybody can't become an innovator. It's a very, uh, it's a very uh, uh, thing to achieve. But if everyone can try, we will see more entrepreneurs coming out of our uh, society. So I think uh, that's the basis of uh, uh, Archipreneur program, which is a brainchild of uh, architect uh, Upendra Randini. We have been talking about this uh, almost three years ago. Uh, I think in 2018, we had a few, uh, uh, about two to three uh, sessions as well at SLIA. Of course, those days we had the privilege of, you know, having physical meetings, but now things have changed. But uh, I'm really glad that uh, we can start this program again, but of course, virtually uh, for the time being because of the pandemic situation. So what we are trying to do is basically uh, uh, with my experience in starting startups and also working in an organization, which uh, I sometimes, there are a few organizations that I funded and also there are certain organizations that I co-founded with my uh, past uh, 10 to 15 years of experience, uh, I have sort of uh, identified about eight areas where if you want to move from a professional to an entrepreneur or an innovator, there are certain areas that you have to be uh, thorough with. Of course, uh, this is a huge area. Uh, it's, a, it's not an area that you can cover within a uh, you know, couple of days. So, but the essentials of entrepreneurship uh, uh, for an architect, uh, so we have uh, formed a eight day program. So each, each, pro, each day program would be about uh, two hours. Uh, and uh, so it covers areas like a uh, lot of areas, you know, I mean, not, not new things for architects, but maybe we are, we are looking at a, in a different uh, critical way, for example, product development and innovation. That's one uh, uh, segment. Then of course, design thinking in a different, different way. We will look at business uh, plan development, then also working capital management and the financial literacy, then marketing and sales skills essentials. Then also how to uh, pitch a product and also a bit of operational management related things like legal and HR essential. So those are the main ones. And also the last session would be uh, the participant will be given a chance to pitch uh, one of their product ideas in front of a panel. So that's the, the program. It's a uh, eight uh, sessions all together, uh, each session uh, around two hours. And uh, so what you are going to do is uh, within a short period of time, say two months period uh, to develop uh, skills, essential skills that are required to become an entrepreneur, architect to become an entrepreneur. So that's the program we call Archipreneur. So thank you very much. So I hope uh, uh, we will see uh, a lot of uh, budding entrepreneurs uh, will, would join this program uh, to become Archipreneurs uh, in, in your own area. I mean, of course, you don't have to completely change your profession. Uh, but of course, if you are looking at, uh, uh, you know, coming up with entirely different areas into, into entrepreneurship, that is, that is also possible. So I would uh, expect uh, 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 out of the 60 to 70 participated in this uh, session, we'll join uh, this program as well. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have uh, one of our very own members, architect Chevy Basmaikal. Uh, presenting the course on anthropology in architecture and humanitarian response. Uh, so she needs no introduction to our members. Um, architect Chevy, uh, are you here? 
Can you go ahead? Hi, Born members. The SLIA is hopeful that you are coping with these challenging times and wish you well. While you are in this lockdown situation and thinking about the way forward with the profession, we at SLIA were also thinking along the same line and would like to share with you one of the options that we have studied and would like to have your consideration on this presentation. Before I explain the course structure, let me talk about why this course is important to expand opportunities in employment and gaining new skills. We started by asking ourselves a few questions. What is the current profile of architects? And is it relevant in the current and future context? Does it need to be re-examined, improved, changed, expanded? And if so, how do we do it? Or what do we do to achieve these ends? Let's have a look. Architects needs to be more inclusive and bring their experience and share those skills with all human beings, increasing the pool of potential clients. Although architecture is not compelled, it nevertheless embodies artistic and aesthetic dimensions. Also, the incorporation or the utilization of human rights in the field of architecture makes it relevant and essential to contemporary problems that create tension in our professional life. Therefore, there is a need for an expanded professional profile for architects and a direct link to the profession. In Sri Lanka, although 95% of the population never meets with an architect, they however benefit unconsciously when they use public buildings such as hospitals, schools and the like. What this course aims at is to change that by making architects integral in global humanitarian operations. In Sri Lanka, around 95% of the local population have no access to the solutions and products that architecture could bring. It is unfortunate that the majority of human beings live in substandard conditions and dwellings and even worse conditions when man-made or natural catastrophes happen. So let me begin by quoting from the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights and I refer to Article 25. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for health and well-being of himself and of his family. When we take this rights-based approach and interface architecture with human rights, it becomes global and the architect's responsibility also has the same dimensions. Architecture cannot solve the problems of social inequality by on its own even though we address issues like disability requirements. However, it is an essential part of the whole, like education, healthcare, income distribution, and the like. Each of these parts plays its role in making it a whole and where in architecture deals with spatial opportunities and dimensions at the broadest level. It is a fact that the planet is populated by 5.2 billion people and as I said before, who don't associate architecture with most public goods they use. We remain invisible, unlike medicine, law, accountancy or many of the other professions. This is a paradox and we need to change and we do this by expanding the scope and opportunities for architects to penetrate into this 5.2 billion people and be seen and recognized. We cannot continue to serve the rich and the discerning clients in cities, which is a finite group and have increasing number of us compete for the same client base. So is it any wonder that finding jobs for an ever increasing number of architects is a growing problem? Therefore, the SLIA has decided to work actively to make our profession relevant in all fields thus far not utilized by the vast majority and expand its usefulness to as many as possible. 
Then to achieve this, the SLIA has taken upon itself as its duty to expand the impact of the architectural profession in a wider range of areas in society, not just as a consumption good, but also make it relevant and available to the common people. This course is one such initiative. Globally, one of the main calls from the population is for real opportunities to influence decision and political structures capable of protecting the citizens. Therefore, the rights-based approach we have chosen links up with the United Nations and other global initiatives. In some countries, the field of architecture is beginning to enhance not only space but also the social balance. Examples of such activities are humanitarian emergencies where suitably qualified architects work, for example, the Barefoot Architect Program or Architects Without Borders work. Architecture in this form addresses social balance and social mobility and is an enabler supporting peacemaking in conflicts. While it is true jobs are hard to find, looking at the same opportunity and expecting a different result is not helpful. We need to think outside the box. That is why we are looking at targeting the 5.2 billion new and larger group of untapped people. I have been talking a lot about the skill set expansion and how it impacts on this new initiative. Permit me now to talk about the remuneration. This expansion of the profession is about enhancing our professional skill set and to increase our income base. Globally, you cannot do one without the other. The advantage is that these jobs pay the same amount irrespective of any other criteria. The remuneration is based on the scope of the job and responsibilities, not the person based on a globally agreed scale which remains competitive to recruit the best people. I am actually very pleased to tell you that we are not reinventing the wheel and taking unknown risks. There are architects who have explored this avenue and they have done it. They are Shegurban, Zev Architects, Catapult, Julia King, Alejandro Avena from Elemental and others alike have tried it and have tested this approach successfully. I will elaborate on two to give you a flavor. Shegurban, Pisca winning architect Shegurban is the founder of the Voluntary Architects Network and renowned for his innovative use of recyclable material to create high quality and low cost shelters for disaster victims across the globe. His compassionate approach to design has impacted the lives of people from Rwanda to Haiti, India and Japan inspiring a dedicated following. Zev Architects, an Iranian practice that is committed to a research-driven, case-specific architecture that not only helps improve the built environment, but also helps establish a more coherent school of thought for the field of architecture in the Middle East and wider region. All of these people have also, not only been designing and putting structures up, as you can see from their projects, they have been working with society, very poor components of society. And that is the type of skill that this course is trying to offer all the course participants. For all these reasons, the Board of Management of the SLIA has developed an interesting course to provide you with a skill set to handle such humanitarian projects. So what we will be talking about in this course is building on the skill sets that we already have. So you have core skills that every architect who is practicing has obtained. That is why you are certified and obtained your membership. In addition to that, to work in the 95% of the population, especially on a global setting, Additional skills will be needed if you are to be effective and provide thinking outside the box in a critical manner as part of a global or local emergency response team. This is the focus of this course. As you may be aware that there are three main aspects of the humanitarian response process and they are 
disaster phase, recovery phase, and reconstruction phase. These are the things that we would be exploring in this course. So let me explain the course structure. Anthropology in Architecture and Humanitarian Response. This course is aimed at increasing awareness, employability and mobility of Sri Lankan architects locally and abroad on globally competitive remuneration packages. So this course will also expand and create for the architects a new specialism where they would have an appreciation of the linkages and the ability to apply anthropological frameworks in architecture in a humanitarian setting. It would be a 1 to 16 day lecture program and each session will be one hour. This program of interactive learning would be pitched at the postgraduate level. The series looks at architecture from a non-practitioner's view but from a user perspective. So to break it down a bit, we would start with an introduction to aims and objectives, then a recap on the essence of architecture in context and introduce anthropology at the gross level zero on cultural anthropology. We would also discuss links between architecture and cultural anthropology and then illustrate with concrete examples of the challenges faced and creative solutions in real life. Following this, humanitarian work definitions standards and details with examples of practical real-life challenges would also be discussed. We would then continue to draw the series and tie it encompassing the value and usefulness of architecture, anthropology and the human being. So the resource persons for the course will be Mr. Ajit Fernando who is our principal resource person, is an international civil servant educated in New Zealand and Canada in political science, anthropology, international relations, public policy, and has professional membership in internal auditing, also a university lecturer. He's also widely traveled and worked in Asia, Africa, Oceania, and the Middle East, specializing in humanitarian emergency response in conflict situations. Our very own Dr. Seneca Dharmathilaka, visiting lecturer, University of Moratua and Columbus School of Architecture. We also know Dr. Ranjit Dayaratna very well, who is an Associate Professor of Architecture of the University of Bahrain. He is an architect specialized in socially conscious design, architectural theory and people place transactions. Professor Samita Hetige. Professor Hetige is a professor of management focusing on organizational conflict prevention. He is a consultant researcher and a visiting faculty at universities in Malaysia, India and Sri Lanka. Professor Kapila Silva. He is a professor of architecture and the associate dean for diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging in the School of Architecture and Design at the University of Kansas, USA. A course information pack will be sent over to you all once the course has been finalized with certification. This presentation is to create awareness about the specialty subject that the SLIA is proposing to you. So if you have any questions at all, Mr. Ajit Fernando, the principal resource person is on the Zoom with us right now and you could direct your questions over to him. Thank you and stay safe. Uh, so we will have the vote of thanks by um, architect uh, Upendra Ramben. Yes. 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 So uh, what a fantastic evening uh, to begin with. I think COVID has brought the best in us. And I've been a good example of that. And when I was listening to this entire presentation, uh, I have written four words. One is wow, second is bravo, third is quandary, and fourth is proud. So let me start with the first wow. The amount of work that had gone into this. It's, it's uh, you know, as some of the speakers said, that they can know what they of this, right? So to do this in a such a short time after taking uh, our uh, uh, 
positions in the council within the last three months, which was the quarantine time. So, wow, the work you have done, including the staff of SLI and all the uh, relevant uh, people who have worked on it. Bravo to the speakers, because they have hit the nail on the head and brought out the necessity to identify that change is needed and change to be more resilient to bring about the best in us uh, in terms of uh, being architect, right? So let me start by saying uh, thank you to Heminder who brought out the concept of innovators, innovation and entrepreneurship, and he can bring out the best in our architects. Uh, Irushika, uh, who brought out the concept of soft skills and personality development. Uh, architect Upendra Rajapaksa, talking about high performance buildings, which is uh, somewhat very different to the green and the sustainable concept we keep on talking about. So thank you, Upen. Uh, fourth is Clive J uh, James, who talked about public speaking as a uh, skill to be more resilient. And uh, Vipula uh, Vanika Sekar, who talked about communication in terms of uh, being more resilient. And all these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, all talk about how to be resilient. Last but not least, Chevy Basnaik, a, a fantastic presentation, uh, kind of opening doors to uh, where we should be, which we all talk about, you know, doing uh, service to the nation and the place where you live in, working in community, all that sort of thing. And uh, last uh, but least <laughs> to say that quandary is that we are confused as to which course to follow. Uh, there are so many options and uh, as uh, Sachikala asked, what is the order in uh, picking uh, which courses to follow? I'm sure all those who are listening and all, all those who missed out can uh, look into the future and see what courses to follow. And I guess some of these courses can be repeated because all of us may not be accommodated with these limited uh, facilities and the times that we have. Uh, these courses may be uh, repeated over so that uh, you can join the next uh, next uh, uh, batch as it were. Then finally, uh, proud. I'm so proud of what we have achieved. And uh, to find up, uh, to finalize, let me wish you a, a safe stay, uh, stay healthy, and uh, online hug to all of you. Thank you, and have a good day. Uh, something I need to tell you, uh, tell the audience. <laughs> about my team. So I think we have a very able team. Uh, you know, like uh, the BOM as a champ, very proud of them. So we, they work very hard to achieve all these targets. Uh, so we have, I believe that we have a very energetic team of architects. Uh, architect Russell Dandini, who's the president of SLIA. Architect Upendra Randini, who's the honorary uh, secretary. Architect Dilumini Dimel, Architect Rohan Bandara Herat, Architect Professor Chitra Vedikara, Architect Susil Vedikara, Architect Suzette Vehalle, Architect Shevi Basnaika, Architect Jayanta Domingo, Architect Nilesh De Silva, Architect Migara Alvis, and uh, our webmaster, Mr. Priyanta Vikramarachi, and Kalpani, you supported us a lot. Thank you very much. And last but not the least, architect Minda Gamanaika, who's playing a very supportive role as a secretary of uh, board of management of SLIA. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.